Okay. And I saw that Rodolfo is here. Uh, we're very excited about tonight's presentation. We've got Rodolfo Valdez Barrias, uh, who will be talking about vegetation surveys and low impact management alternatives, particularly uh, solarization for care blue stem at the ABK State Natural Area. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask. Rodolfo, to please turn your video on and um, mic, and you can share your screen. And I see your screen, Rodolfo. Okay, can you all hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, I'm assuming that <clears throat> you don't need my video on, or would you like me to also include a video? I don't know. I guess it's up to you. We usually have the speaker with the video on. I'm going to turn mine off. Okay. It's up to you, Rodolfo. Nice well, that way people can see the face behind the voice or the voice yeah. behind the face. Hey. Thank you for joining us. And I'll just remind everybody that if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll be keeping track of those. And then we'll uh, take those at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Rodolfo. Thank you. Okay, so, um, well, I want to start by thanking everybody for your time um, and also for the invitation. Uh, this is my second time presenting at this wonderful group with this wonderful group. And um, I hope that this presentation gives you some insights on some projects uh, that we're initiating. So what I'm about to present is on its initial stages and it has two objectives. One is to inform our community of native plant supporters. And the second one is to also open up uh, an invitation for you to maybe um, in the short future to come out there to the uh, ABK natural area and volunteer in this project. So those are kind of the two objectives uh, behind this presentation. So let's get started. Um, so as you can see, um, I'm, uh, my title is Low Impact Strategy. So we're gonna talk about the very initial stages uh, of this uh, strategy, which is solarization. And then how we're trying to use that to control KR Bluestem in a particular grassland field that is located uh, at the Albert and BC Kronkowski natural area that is located in the hill country, not too far from San Antonio. It's about a 30 minute drive uh, if you live in the northwest side of town. Um, if you wish to communicate or send me more communications, questions uh, about the presentation, uh, about the science behind it, then uh, you can email me. There's my email, jvaldezb at tamusa.edu. Um, I'm here on behalf of Texas A&M San Antonio, and I'm also a member of the Native Plant Society as well. Um, and I also want to uh, give credit to my other co-PI. Her name is Brenda Rushing. She's the professor that helps me with some microbial analysis uh, that we're going to talk about it later, probably in another presentation. And then, of course, uh, the other PIs or co-PIs of this project, which are Don Denier and Jerry Morrissey. Uh, they're the ones that helped me write this proposal. Uh, they're the ones that actually initiated this project and invited me to join them in hopes that we can make some uh, nice findings and, and cool contributions towards this initiative. So uh, just to give you some background of why we think this project is relevant and worth your time. Um, so this project is located at the ABK. So ABK stands for Albert and BC Kronkowski. And uh, this uh, family uh, began buying land in the hill country area uh, near Pipe Creek that's that road, Highway 46, between uh, Bandera Road or Highway 16 and Bernie. So if you go along that road, that's where this property is located. And it's about 3,000 acres. So they began to buy this property in 1946. And by 1973, it was actively being used by this family as a place to go hunting, uh, bring family members. They used to also have gardens. Um, and you could see the extent of the land they started to buy was about 3,000 acres. And then um, they decided later in their lives to donate this land to the state of Texas to protect it from development. So if you're familiar with the Hill Country area, that's a big um, issue, right, of concern that as 
uh, the hill country becomes um, more developed uh, or appeals to new visitors or incoming visitors to Texas that we may have to be in the situation where we need to find ways to protect it. So this is a beautiful space to protect some of that hill country vegetation. So in 2011, the Texas Park and Wildlife Department accepted and then initiated the process of evaluating, assessing the property and creating a management plan. So the natural area is not open for visitors, uh, but it is available or open for volunteers that are willing to help uh, with the current planning and development phase. So just to give you the basics on what that is, the development phase is just collecting baseline data. Uh, it basically involves a lot of surveys. So some groups of people are doing geologic surveys, some other are doing wildlife surveys. In my case, I'm doing a combination of vegetation surveys with soil surveys. I'm gonna try some techniques to see how we can suppress some of the invasive species. Um, and the idea is that uh, they want to collect some of that data, especially areas that will be developed or areas that should not be developed. And so all of those decisions need to be backed by some kind of rigor, science, and, um, and information. So with that in hand, the Texas Park uh, and Wildlife um, has created this public use plan guide. And this is what they're in the process of creating. And once they finalize this, right, then they're gonna be able to start planning. Um, they're only planning on using about 50 acres of the property. So there's still a lot of land that they wanna keep untouched. But the idea is to allow visitors to come and to recreate and to learn a little bit about that little piece of wildlife. I might now, right now it might not seem very relevant, but I think in the future, um, once, you know, if development continues in the whole country area, places like ABK are gonna be jewels to be protected and admired. So another part of my project is to uh, give credit to the people that have made all of this possible. So some of them, some of you might know some of these uh, members of the team, but the reason why I wanna address this is that even though I'm the PI in the project, I allow all my volunteers and all my team members to have a say, to share their thoughts, to give their opinion. And so it's our project, you know, I'd like to put the word our there. Uh, so this is our first member, Tom Denier. Uh, Tom has been very active in making things happen. He has a long history at this location. He's very knowledgeable of the area and is also helping us with all the logistics. So Tom has been very important in the project. Then we have uh, Jerry and Fred, many of you know him. I've actually um, have been working with them at AM with some uh, pollinator gardening uh, projects and they've been very supportive of uh, involving AM in this um, in this collaboration with the Native Plant Society. Uh, so Fred, for instance, is helping me to develop a temperature uh, monitoring system for the solarization project. And Jerry is also helping with the design and the plant identification. So everybody has a very special niche. I also have Greg Fest, for those of you that know, do not know Greg. Greg is also a very active volunteer at the ABK. And he's also very knowledgeable about plants and very helpful. He's very organized and keeps up in track. And then he are, uh, and I didn't choose this photo to be this way. It just happened that all the women were in one photo and then the men, I had to fish and find their photos somewhere else. But this is uh, the female in our team uh, here. If you can recognize some of them, this is Claire Mitchell, uh, Brenda Fest, um, Melva Jacobson, uh, Kila, um, and Kila uh, Bridge Mohan, she is a student that just joined us. I don't know. I hope we can get her to participate a little bit more often. Um, but she's one of our youngest members. And then of course, uh, Claire Carter. Uh, Claire is also uh, very active in the group and also uh, a very good photographer. So a lot of the images you will see uh, were taken by Claire. And Melba, for instance, uh, one of the things that I've learned is that Melba has been there for a long time. So she happens to know a lot about the history of the place and the history of the area. So um, that's been really cool. So I just wanted to, uh, 
most of these credits I've left towards the end of the presentation. I want to start with the people that have made all of this possible. And lastly, everything we've done is 100% done by volunteers. Okay, so where is this ABK located? Uh, well, for those of you that don't know, it's located on this north corner uh, of Bear County, taking uh, Bandera Road. So if you take Bandera Road, right when you hit Pipe Creek, um, Highway 46, you take a right turn, and then to your left, you're gonna see the entryway to the property. So all of this green area that you see here is part of those 3,000 acres uh, of the uh, Kronkowski uh, property. So uh, part of my project is to conduct a study in a particular area. And for this area, we chose um, a grass, grassy area uh, called the Doobie Field. And the Doobie Field um, is part of a geologic fault that you can see here. That's uh, Busy Creek, but Busy Creek happens to be a geologic fault that made almost like a step. If you think this as being a series of steps, there's a step and creates these alluvial deposits where grasses actually can grow. So it is believed that the Kronkowski used this area for probably some type of grazing in the past. And then eventually uh, this needs to probably be developed and it's going to play some important role. We don't know yet what we're gonna do there. We just know we're supposed to uh, come up with some plans. So if you look at this, this is a close up of the property and this pink area is the area where we've been allowed to do a lot of our study. The reason why we're restricted to actually do too much on other parts of the field is because there's a lot of archeological uh, artifacts in these places. Um, I don't know how far back they date, uh, but there's um, arrow tips and uh, archeological artifacts that uh, are still being uh, studied. So the archeologist on staff uh, asked or requested that we do not disturb the soil in most of the areas adjacent to the river. And so right now we're only allowed to uh, take soil samples and concentrate most of our efforts here. And then in the other area, we have to do very minimal uh, impact uh, studies. So to, just to give you kind of a scenario of what we're working with. So uh, what's the main issue with this field? Well, what happened is that like anything in Texas, um, a lot of the land that we have in Texas uh, was used for either agricultural uh, or grazing. We have wonderful soils, mollusol soils that are perfect uh, for grazing cattle all the way from North Texas to South Texas. However, throughout the history of grazing, there's been uh, interesting decisions that have been made. For instance, since the 1930s, the US Department of Agriculture and other state and, and federal agencies uh, introduced grasses uh, about 14 species of grasses uh, from parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa, with the intent of improving local varieties and increased production for the cattle industry. Unfortunately, they bred these grasses that were so strong and so aggressive that now that we're not longer grazing some of these spaces, they become heavily invasive. And we're trying to figure out ways to control them because now they're actually displacing, suppressing, um, the native species that should be in those areas. So um, as you can see in 1995, there was a level of active grazing in the area. Then in 2008, you could see that grazing or fire was restricted because you can start seeing the intrusion uh, of woody plants. In 2011, the park took over the administration of the property. And you can see that by 2013, the woody plants, most of this is just basically cedar, had taken over the field. Like we know in Texas, if you remove grazing and if you remove fire, particularly fire, the woodies come over. So they conducted a prescribed fire early in 2018 and they were able to basically remove, I believe they use a combination of mechanical removal uh, and prescribed burns. Uh, the burn wasn't that hot and that deep, but was enough to remove some of that biomass. However, it was successful at suppressing the cedar, but it was not successful at getting rid of the KR. So KR bluestem is the species that predominates in this area on most of the parts of the hill country 
area. Uh, remember, it was brought uh, as a very uh, altern good alternative for forage uh, in the, I believe in the uh, 1960s or something like that. So it's taken over a lot of the hill country area um, and this is what's been happening. Okay, so one of the things that we've been doing is to conduct a survey, but before we even do the survey is to become familiar with the land. And one of the things that we know about the land in the hill country area of parts of Texas is that um, the vegetation responds very directly to soil dynamics. So understanding the soil and understanding what's below ground is very essential. Um, it's incredibly important in order to know what we can do. So being new to the area, uh, we conducted some surveys. So what you see in front is data that was collected from a website called Soil uh, Web Surveys. And the Soil Web Surveys is a cool little database that you can access uh, free online. And you can uh, locate a particular piece of land and collect all this information as long as there are soil surveys in the area. So I was able to go ahead and uh, collect this information for the Doobie field. And I found that it has three main soil types. So if you're familiar with some soil geology uh, or soil taxonomy, the main soils that um, or the most prevalent soil components in the area that we're working are the Crumb Prattley Association and in the Kerrville Gravelly Clay Loam. So um, the soils that we have there, most of them is the Crumb and Prattley Association. So if you look up below, this is what the soil profile looks like. This is a pit of two meters deep that was excavated by a geologist way back when and then they decided to look at the different soil layers and the soil profile, two meters deep. And what's nice about this is that it allows anybody like yourself or myself to know what's below ground, what type of soils we have below ground, and um, what, what layer, uh, for instance, has more clay, what layer has more sand, and this can be very important in many ways. So this is what the soil profile looks like and using this website, you can click at each layer and you can find out the chemistry. You can find out a lot about that. So you can make decisions when it comes to management. So here's another important uh, information about the site. We know it has KR. We know a little bit about the soils using this tool, but we can also know a little bit about its ecology. So what this um, tool also does, it gives you information, for instance, not only on the type of soil that we already talked about, but the type of ecological sites. So here you see ecological sites. This is how they're called. And they're defined mainly by the type of soil. So a lot of the area where I'm conducting my study is mainly clay loams. So immediately that tells me that at least the upper surface uh, where I'm gonna put a crop or when I put a plant, it's a clay loam area. And that tells me uh, a lot of the uh, physical features. But I wanted to go a little bit more in detail and understand more what that soil profile looks like. So you can go ahead and retrieve information for those kind of soils. And if you notice, it tells me, for instance, that when you get around about a meter deep, uh, the sand concentration starts to increase a little bit. So I'm thinking, well, if I'm putting a plant and it's developing its roots, why will, what would that plant encounter? Well, you know that some plants love sandy soils, some other plants love clay soils. So that's going to affect what plant you will see or how the plant will develop. Uh, another information that it's giving me is that about 40% silt across, and then that the majority of the upper layers from about zero to about a meter deep are clay. So we have a very clear clay area on the top and a sandier layer at about a meter deep. So that's important because sand means more water infiltration and clay means that water retention is happening there, but also means that there's a lot of nutrients uh, that are going to be trapped in that clay. Now, what's in that clay and what's surrounding the clay? Well, if you notice, uh, another information that we learn about the soils is the high level of calcium carbonate that comes from that bedrock of limestone that is typical of our hill country area. 
So we know that there's no gypsum, but there's calcium carbonate and it peaks right about 100 uh, centimeters. So right about a meter is when you're hitting a high concentration. So what that tells me is that the pH in the soil as I get deeper is gonna get more alkaline. And as you are closer to the surface, it's a little bit less alkaline. So here's some information now about carbon. Carbon is really important because it tells me where plants are gonna get their food source. So plants uh, are going to generate carbon and are gonna utilize carbon for a lot of things. Uh, so here you can see that a large composition of carbon, probably from that calcium carbonate and from root biomass is found right about a hundred uh, centimeters or a meter depth, okay? So now we're learning a little bit about these fields in terms of organic matter, carbon, uh, a little bit of pH. So you're not blindfolded. And what's nice about this is that I haven't even done a soil analysis yet with my own tools. I can learn all this information ahead of time and then uh, get a better idea of what we're gonna do. So now that we've learned a little bit about the site, about its soils, let's learn about the above ground. So there's an above ground problem, but before I touch the above ground, I need to know what's happening below ground, just like with the human body, right? Um, you wanna know what's happening inside to understand what are the symptoms you're showing. So the current problem at Dewey Field is that Carabloustum dominates the entire area, like a lot of places around the hill country area. And the only well-established native plant is little bluestem. So we're gonna see that little bluestem in some areas has been able to uh, find a little gap, find a little bit of a room. And other animals are present, uh, but it's just animals and they're relatively low in density and distribution. So what the uh, Texas Park and Wildlife Survey has found is that uh, fire alone has not been effective as a control method for these grasses. The only available method, and many of you already know that, is to eliminate these invasive species, you have to do some heavy mechanical disking at least six inches into the ground multiple times. Okay, that's out of the question because it has archeological evidence. So in an area that has a lot of archeological artifacts, you cannot disk. Okay, next. If you go in the textbook of invasive management, multiple applications of glyphosate. So you disturb it, you disc it, you spray it with glyphosate, and then you repeat that multiple times until you deplete that pool of invasives. Well, second problem, right on the west side of that is BC Creek. That is the habitat of a couple of um, endemic um, um, amphibians. And that, that's an issue. So if we're gonna put glyphosate, you know that amphibians are heavily sensitive to runoff and herbicides and other kind of chemicals. And so that's also a no-no. So that basically ties the hand of a manager. You cannot use glyphosate. You cannot use mechanical disturbance. You can actually use these two treatments and combine them with a burn, but the burn alone is not enough. Um, and then sheet seeding, no matter what you do, should always follow the treatment because sometimes the seed pool has been depleted or the seed pool is mostly invasive and very little natives. So let's look at, if you haven't had a chance to visit this place, this is what it looks like. You go over there and you find mostly a predominant KR area, but in some areas you can actually identify pockets of little bluestone. So what we did is uh, we initiated a survey to identify what's out there. And we found that in some areas, not only do we find a little bit of uh, blue stem, but a little bit of soto that is growing over there. So in order to identify the blue stem, you can see here the browner um, seed heads. That, oh, those are from the previous season from last fall. Uh, this was conducted in the spring. And then using um, a drone, we took the, uh, the drone off the ground and about 60 feet, we're starting collecting pictures and data to get a better idea of what the field looks like. So these are areas that were predominantly dominated by cedar. The cedar was removed. And for some reason, after it was burned, it left some gaps. And we found that immediately within those gaps, the little bluestem started to uh, you know, become successful. 
the KR is not entering those gaps. Maybe there's a little chemicals. Uh, we don't know yet what's going on, but there's these little gaps, these little areas where KR hasn't even touched those areas and only little blue stem has been able to become established. Okay, so that's something we could probably learn about and use. Here's another example. The area was dominated by cedar, cedar was removed, and it's the only place where little blue stem has had a chance to become established uh, around this area. So we see an ocean of invasives and little islands of natives. So the question we wanna ask is how can we change this dynamic? We cannot use glyphosate, we cannot, well, we can burn, but that's about what we can do. So uh, for these areas dominated by KR bluestem, we first need to identify how it's distributed in relationship to these islands. So what we did is that we created these surveys where you have the island in the center. So this is the island of natives, those little blue stems. And then we conducted transects. So these are linear transects where you grab a tape measure for about 25 meters in three different directions. And the idea is we want to get almost like a 360 um, map of how that area, that island looks. And we also want to know uh, how much of that island and the density within that island uh, is made up of little blue stem and how much of it is KR blue stem. So this tool allows you to um, go using gradient. And for this, we use a technique called the line point intercept. The line point intercept means that you grab a ruler and every meter along your transect, you take into account the plant that you're touching. And what it gives me is an a, an idea of spatial distribution uh, and composition of the vegetation community. So here you can see uh, Fred Luxon and Jerry Morrissey uh, collecting data on one of the transects. Jerry's holding a ruler. He's placing the ruler on the ground and he's using it for two things. One, to tell Fred what grasses are present, but also the, how tall that grass is. If they find all their plants, they would also register those plants and give the height. So we know if they're baby plants or if they're adult plants. So the height is really important to let us know what is the predominant high vegetation and what is the predominant lower vegetation and what's close to the ground. So we have volunteers working in pairs, one at the, at the transect north, which is transect one. Another one is on the southeast, which is transect three and the other one is on the Southwest. So we had two volunteers, a total of six people collecting data every meter. And that was a very amazing contribution. So here is an example of the data they collected. And just to show you what we can do with this data. So the very first thing we learned from this is what are the predominant plants that we find? So if you look at the transect that was facing North, this one over here, uh, the predominant vegetation over there was mostly KR bluestem. And we found KR bluestem probably between zero to the 25 meters. However, little bluestem was predominantly found between zero and 21 meters. This tells us the average height. So we know that the little bluestem was a little taller than the KR. And we also know that there were a couple of, you know, individual little plants that we detected. And we found uh, mullet grass. So in this case, it was uh, Mullenbergia lenheimeri. I'm showing it over here on the bottom. And of course, switchgrass. So we were able to see a couple of other plants. Now, what's interesting is that those two natives were found between 12 to about 13 meters. And I apologize for that typo. That's uh, not 132 meters, that's 13 uh, meters. And Fred, uh, told me to fix that and I completely missed that. So my apologies, Fred, for that. Okay, and then as, as far as forbs, you can actually separate your plants by grasses and forbs. So in terms of forbs, we find that Draba, uh, Draba cunifolia uh, was found between zero to 15 meters. So it's mainly in the island and Indian blankets were found from 15 to 25 meters. And then mullein, uh, which is an invasive species was also found at 14 meters. So that's our north transect. Then we went to the other two transects. Um, and those two transects are telling us that the carablustum uh, in this area is only in the outer edge of the island. And most of the little blustum is in the inner side of the island. 
So by using this technique, I'm already mapping where is the highest density of those plants. And it's telling me that there's something going on in that island where the little blue stem is doing better and the KR is dominating outside. And the big question is why? We don't know yet. Uh, we'll find out as we continue with this research. But we're using these tools to show you how you can use linear transects in different orientations to give you data of what's going on out there. So these are the most uh, prevalent and important annual fours that we found. Um, this one over here is Drava cunifolia on the left, and on the right side is Vicia ludoviciana or uh, tear peevage. So here's an image of both. And what's fascinating about them is that they're very opportunistic. And uh, Vicia in particular is able to grow and exploit this heavy pack niche created by KR Bluestem. So we understand that at least when it comes to Forbes, these two species somehow are managing to grow. Draba does a little bit better with um, the presence of little bluestem, uh, but in this case, Vicia is growing really well under that mat of KR. So that's interesting to know in terms of plant dynamics and the species that we're finding outside. So outside of that survey, uh, we conducted those uh, surveys using the transects, and then we uh, took the drone up and with um, we used an Inspire 1.2 drone from DJI, um, and we were able to take it up to about about 100 feet. That's as high as we can go because uh, we have what's called a geo um, barrier, and that geo fence or geo barrier is a high power line that is at about 150 feet from the ground. So my, my drone can only uh, go to about 90 feet. So most of the images you see here, we're taking out about 60 feet to avoid any accident with the drone and the high power lines. So one of the things you could see is that in other parts of the property, the vegetation of KR is not as dense. And one of the interesting things you see is that this is the cleared area on the left side of the property uh, where there's a lot of runoff. It appears to be a lot of runoff. There appears to be a lot of gaps. And most of what you see there is a combination of a little bit of KR, but also a lot of little bluestem. So you find a high density of little bluestem in these areas. But what's also interesting is that we take, took a closer look at these gaps. And one of the things that we brought to the attention uh, of the park uh, staff was the presence of soil biocrosts. Um, I think this is something that we want to put on the radar. It appears that these fields had not been touched for almost uh, probably 12 years or more uh, by cattle, uh, definitely 20 years by anything else that uh, sporadic ungulates that are visiting or feral hogs. And that has left uh, these areas free from any trampling, any altering vehicles. Uh, what that means is that this cryptobiotic soil uh, which is made up of a film of bacteria and fungi. And sometimes there's a little bit of moss, some bryophytes, and also lichens. Here we have a particular lichen that is typical of that area, which is Sora crenata. And what's interesting is that Sora crenatas are a very cosmopolitan lichen. And some research has actually shown that there's extracts of this lichen uh, that have anti-cancer anti properties. So I don't know if this is using as anti-cancer therapy, but we know that these type of lichens can actually suppress tumor growth and development. So right below your feet, uh, all of a sudden, we're paying attention to the grasses, and then we realize that within those gaps, there is this very delicate uh, ecosystem uh, of crust that needs to be protected, uh, that plays a lot of important roles. It helps with plant establishment. It also helps with water percolation. Uh, and so we hope that Texas Park and Wildlife can actually take into account the cryptobiotic soil uh, that is found uh, within the gaps that you see here. So when the gaps get a little bit bigger, and what's nice about the cryptobiotic soil is that these layers of fungi are actually preventing the top soil from being removed. So they're actually conserving that from heavy runoff uh, or other types of erosion. Okay, so the second part of our study after we've done the preliminary part of the survey is to start our solarization. So just to give you a quick introduction on why we're using solarization, 
Well, one is because it's a common method used in agriculture, actually, uh, and it has a lot of um, mixed opinions, uh, in part because in agriculture, it's used as a way to uh, thermally suppress the weed. Uh, it's normally combined with a herbicides, some kind of bromide herbicide that is injected under a plastic sheet. So you will see in kibbutz in Israel or in Africa or Saudi Arabia, they'll put these long layers of plastic uh, and then under it, they will actually suppress all the weeds and grow things like melon, cotton, um, or watermelon still go really well with that method. So there was an idea of trying to incorporate that into the grasslands by trying to use solarization as a mean of uh, using convective heat from the sun. So the sun is directing all its heat and then the moisture and the plastic are trapping that heat below. And the idea is that when temperatures go right about 120 degrees, you start to uh, stress the plant. In this case is the KR. And then the KR, uh, the problem is that it can no longer adequately exchange gases and release its heat. The way that a plant can keep itself from overheating is by transpiration. So by overheating, it'll transpirate, transpirate, and eventually uh, start losing uh, water. So one of the things that we do is we use an instrument called a leaf perimeter. And we put that to look at conductivity. And what that tells us is how much water and moisture is coming out of the leaves uh, of those plants. So what we intend to do is to estimate and calculate the leaf porosity from the KR when we put the plastic. And then as the plastic treatment uh, continues, we'll be taking these measurements. Another effect of solarization is that we don't know exactly at which depth is affected. So is it affecting only the top vegetation or can it actually affect the deeper roots? And for that, Fred Loxum is helping me uh, conducting a neat study where we're gonna put this little thermometers called eye buttons that you can put into the soil. And we're gonna be able to uh, collect information on the solarization treatment. And another, um, you know, idea behind solarization is that it appears to be the most promising and least harmful method available uh, after considering mechanical removal and glyphosate. This is perfect, by no means it's perfect, but it's something we can give it a try and give it a shot. So this is how we're conducting our study. Uh, we're creating plots in the field. I'm gonna show you the images of those plots. Um, and these rectangles are the plots, they're five by 10. And there's different treatments that we're doing side by side. The C is a control. Uh, the S is the area that is solarized. So we're putting a plastic over it. Uh, SM means that we're solarizing it and then adding its mixture. And M means that it's a control that eventually would receive a seed mixture. And we're repeating this four times. So we have one, two, three, and four replicates. And the idea is that we're going to see how the controls compare from the areas that have been solarized. Another thing that we did is that we weed whacked and cleared and leveled all that grass. And right now we're on phase one, which is uh, placing our plastic tarps. So again, just so you can see each replication uh, and the selection of the plot is completely random. And the reason why we're doing many replicates is because it allows us to consider the differences in the soil variations that we have in that field. So we have some plots on one side of the field, we have some plots on the other side of the field, two and two, and then we have these different treatments to ask those different questions. Again, what is the effect of solarization? Can seeds become established after the soil has been solarized? What happens when you do nothing and what happens when you don't solarize but you add a seed mixture. Okay, so this is uh, the study. Um, you already saw the survey being conducted and this is our team of volunteers. We're flagging the plots first. And then after we um, put the plots with these flags, we're spacing them about three feet apart. So we have enough space for people to walk in between the plots. Um, our volunteer here was Tom. Tom loves the weed whack. So he's been doing the first weed whacking, uh, then we have to do a second weed whacking. And you can see here, um, Hila is uh, taking some measurements. You can see she has a probe on her hand. And before uh, Tom would come and weed whack, uh, we collected biomass 
uh, using a Dobbin Meyer and collecting and clipping the above ground uh, biomass to know how much grass was there. And also we're taking leaf porosity, right? We're looking at the conductivity of those leaves. And um, we don't have a picture there, but Greg Fest is with another probe called the chlorophyll meter. And what we're trying to do is what's the current chlorophyll uh, content of those plants. So here on the left, you can see, I'm sorry, on the right, you can see the tarp, the plastic, and this is the, the treatment for plastic. That's being weighed down with sandbags. And if you wanna know more information about the plastic, just let me know, uh, send me an email. I can give you more specifics on this plastic. And uh, <clears throat> this is where we're going to also put the temperature probes that Fred Lockstrom is helping me with. And then periodically we will lift the plastic, we will look at the plants and throughout spring, summer and fall, we will monitor how the temperature is changing and what level of damage we're causing. So we will know how much we're hurting the KR by looking at the leaf porosity and looking at the chlorophyll content. And what we predict is that the controls will still have a high porosity, high chlorophyll content. And we hope that uh, we will be able to see when is the maximum temperature at which the minimal or minimum amount of chlorophyll and uh, lowest level of leaf porosity is actually found. And what we hope is that tells us that we are hurting the plant and what temperature is that. So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, this is pretty much um, the information that we have. Um, what we're planning on doing now is continue uh, monitoring the site. Uh, we will be conducting more surveys like the one I showed you before. Uh, and we're gonna start collecting data on every uh, bi-weekly uh, basis uh, of these plots. So as you can see, there is about six people out there. So six people is a good number to have out there, but look at this, uh, volunteers are helping and we might need more volunteers to make the work go a little bit quicker. Uh, because it's summertime, we're starting our work between seven or eight in the morning and wrapping it about 11 before it gets too hot. Uh, particularly in July and August, it's gonna get hot really early. So if you are interested in learning about the effects of solarization, if you would like to try some techniques for soil survey or plant survey, um, or um, if you wanna you know, see how this project is doing, uh, you can do a couple of things. So let me give you some information. So you can uh, reach out to James Rice. So James Rice uh, is the superintendent. Uh, he's the one only staff. And then the entire place is actually run by volunteers. It's a very amazing. He's the only one staff from Texas Park and Wildlife. And then the rest is an amazing team of volunteers that run a lot of stuff. Uh, he will give you information of what's going on with the park. Uh, below, I included also a link. Also, if you Google um, ABK, it'll give you an interesting little website. It'll give you some of the information I presented. Uh, and in order to participate and work in this project, if you'd like to do that, you have to be a registered volunteer. So that means that you have to fill up a form. They have to do a background check on you. And then um, you have to meet with their volunteer coordinator. His name is Tom. And Tom would actually just show you around, um, ask you some basic questions. And then all you need to do is be in the email list so that when we go out again in the field, we can include you, give you some training and have you go out there and work with us like the other volunteers did. Well, so that's everything that I have for today. I am open for questions. Uh, I think I finished a little bit early, but hopefully that will allow people to ask some questions or provide some comments. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Rodolfo. Um, I have heard about this property and I think it was Jerry that was telling me about it uh, before it uh, became a, an SNA uh, or just in general and how special it is. So that's exciting that you're doing this work here. Um, we do have a, a few questions here. Uh, one of the, well, the first question, it was before you showed your uh, plastic um, and your setup. And the question was what color of tar, clear or opaque? So that's a very interesting question. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, the person who gave us some guidance was uh, David 
and his last name escapes my mind right now, and I apologize for that. Um, David is a member of the uh, Society of Ecological Restoration, and he's been doing solarization for ages. He's been doing like 15 years of solarization. And David found in his study using actually pool tarps, he was using those plastic tool tarps. So he tried black ones, blue ones. And what he found is that the transparents were the best ones at allowing the higher incidence of solar transfer, but at the same time, still trapping you know, that heat. So you have that conductive heat going in through solar radiation, and then that conductive heat getting trapped under it. So apparently the transparent option, even though you would think, well, yeah, there's still solar radiation going in into the plant. Well, when you bring up the temperature about 120, then you really stress it. So apparently, and agriculture is black. If you go to any agricultural field where they're using solarization, they normally use a black one. But for this particular study, when you're leaving some of our remaining vegetation on top, the transparent is what's being recommended. So that's kind of what we're doing right now. That's really interesting. And it, it is the opposite of what I would have thought you would want, um, but it makes perfect sense. Um, you, we could see it with the heat that's um, kicked up in the past week or so, suddenly heat, everything that was so happy from all the rain is suddenly wilted. It doesn't take much from the heat. So interesting. Um, Okay, someone else was asking about on the volunteering, uh, is it still weekdays only for volunteering? Do you know that? It, right now we've been doing it on weekdays uh, because of time availability, uh, but we can consider weekends. Uh, and I think we will have to during some points. So uh, right now during the summertime, it's, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been mostly uh, weekdays, Mondays and, and Fridays. Um, but because we have such a small pool of volunteers and we're just at the very beginning of it. But uh, in the future, we might consider other dates. Um, and, you know, we don't want to, you know, have people turn away from this. If, if you're interested, let us know and we'll try to accommodate uh, the time if possible. And they let you know or they let uh, the, the James Rice that's on your slide as far right, as yeah, so the first step involved. is to, the first step is done at the James Rice level. You know, they have to, uh, that's that's beyond me, that's TPW who, who, who they basically give me the volunteers to some extent, right? Uh, and I'm a volunteer there. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm also another volunteer. So I'm a registered volunteer. And what you will do is that you will become a registered volunteer as well. And once you're an official registered volunteer, just like you do with the, Native Plant Society, you'll start getting updates from the ABK natural area, and they'll make announcements. And it's not only for my project, there's a lot of cool projects going. There's uh, bird surveys, uh, there's butterfly surveys, uh, there's all sorts of activities, geological surveys. So uh, if you want to join ours, that's fine. If you want to do another one, then you, know, you can just join another group. Very good, thank you. Okay, we got another question. Uh, do you anticipate that solarization will have an effect on the existing seed bank in the plots? The existing, what was the last part? Seed bank, the seed bank that's in the in the plots, do you expect that the solarization will have an effect on this, the seed bank that's already in the soil there? Yes, that's a very good question and we don't know for sure. So what we're doing with this eye buttons or thermal sensors is that we're gonna place them right at the surface and right between three to four inches below ground. And we're gonna, because that's where you have your most active seed bank, you know, it's your top two inches. Anything below that is just dormant and would only become active if you move or, you know, have a gopher or you move the soil. So your recruitment will come from those top two inches. We're gonna put the soil probes and then we'll see what germinates out of that. Um, that would be an interesting project. We haven't written down that project, but we would probably conduct one where we're gonna look specifically seed pool and what are the effects of solarization on the seeds because we may have native seeds that might also be damaged too. So there's a lot of criticism of solarization saying would you harm more than actually benefit? So that's why we're doing a small scale trial. Uh, we wanna see what is the optimal temperature um, on the other hand, this area has had KR for many, many years. And when we clear the area in some spaces, we don't see a lot of recruitment coming out. 
So our, our suspicion is that the seed bank, the native seed bank is not that large. So the seed bank we're talking about is probably KR seed bank. Uh, that's probably about 70% of what's out there. So we'll see if it's hurting those seeds and then hopefully the seed mixture that we put after that uh, will basically be there after we remove the solar, the, the tarp, right? So you remove the plastic tarp once you've done the damage and then you reintroduce your, your, your seeds. Yes, I've heard um, on the solarization, as you mentioned, the potential to kill everything in the soil, all the bacteria, all the fungi, everything, all the seed bank, everything. And then, and then it could be challenging to restart with something new, but it is yes, worth exploring. Is, I, do, I do like uh, non-chemical methods. And um, it, uh, we do have another question here, <coughs> excuse me. Um, how would you plan on scaling up? It seems like it would take a huge amount of plastic or time to solarize the area. Yes, so solarization is only, these are basically surgical interventions. We're not talking about a thousand acres, right? We're talking about a barely 10 acre field. So this is for a person that is a small landowner. Uh, for instance, a place, not to throw a curve at that, where I'm very, very interested is the uh, San Antonio River, the Mission Ridge. The Mission Ridge has a lot of invasives. You cannot use glyphosate. You cannot mechanically disturb. So what you would do is like they use in agriculture, uh, these plastic tarps can be 100, 200 yards. And when you unfold the plastic, it's about 10 feet long. So what we're planning on doing is recreating the same thing, but uh, mowing as close to the ground as we can on strips that are 100 to 200 yards. So that's gonna be the second phase of our study um, that's how you scale it up. So basically go strip by strip where you do your, um, your intervention uh, and you can do it multiple times, one at a time, followed by the seed mixture. And that's theoretically what we think would work. But again, you know, we're not talking about restoring a thousand or 3000 acres. That's, we're talking about the, the riparian area, right? A small little strip of land that it's in a very unique area where there's native species, where there's endemic species. Uh, so you might be able to do that at that scale, at that level. So that's 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 one of my areas where I've been wanting to work, the Mission Ridge. Uh, we'll, we'll get there one day. Right now, we're trying to do stuff at the ABK. And there's a, there's a creek right there. So eventually, we'll start to see the effects of that on the creek. And hopefully, it'll be a good, good effects and a good responses. Yes, very interesting. Um, I so on the I, I like that you're using uh, non chemical methods, um, but on the glyphosate, um, there is an aquatic approved glyphosate, and um, if from my understanding, uh, which might be a little bit rusty, is that the glyphosate is still considered the least damaging to the environment because it breaks down quicker. It has a much shorter half-life than almost or all other chemicals that you can use, even other aquatic approved chemicals. Um, so, you know, sometimes that, that, that is why uh, I understand it. It is used and recommended for certain species like KR in certain situations, um, but the formulation has to be the right one to minimize uh, potential impacts. Yeah, sporadic use for sidewalks or areas like that Yes, it's, it's a pretty good, uh, but the amount of glyphosate you have to put to suppress KR or for instance, uh, I mean, it, you're talking about levels of glyphosate that no matter, no matter how bio you call it, it's still uh, a very harmful chemical. And amphibians and highly sensitive animals that breathe through their skin, I mean, uh, that they're gonna be the vulnerable ones. So the problem is that you have to use such high volumes of it and so continuously. Now, if you're sporadically using to spray, you know, trails uh, or to target specific plants, there are ways in we can use effectively glyphosate. The problem is that if you look at the conventional method for eradicating weeds on an extended area, you have to put gallons of that stuff and it's costly. Uh, you don't knock them off with one spray. You have to spray it continuously until you deplete that seed bank, probably three years in a row. And you're basically doing a lot of damage. You're tilling that soil, throwing that herbicide, 
it's it's very draconian if you think about it. Uh, but you're right. I mean, uh, it's not an evil chemical, uh, but for the the way it's being used, the amount is pretty high. So that's why we decided to try this. It's, it's a great point. I, I mean, I think mechanical methods are, are much, much better no matter what. And regardless, for these species, it's multiple treatments. It's going to be labor intensive, period. Yeah. Uh, so. You can't get away with sweating and being out there doing the hard job. <laughs> um, okay, so I also like that you mentioned cryptobiotic soils because uh, I haven't heard that term around here at all. And um, maybe I just, I'm not talking to the right people. Maybe it's more prevalent in West Texas or whatnot, but I, I did learn about it in the Four Corners region and how critically important it is for um, holding the soil together so that plants can get established. So that's really interesting that you you found these uh, a lichen at least. Is there, are there more species or just the one or? We don't know. We haven't even started doing that, but there is a group of people uh, where I've seen a lot of the literature come from California, Utah, uh, Colorado, of course, West Texas, uh, and they even have entire manuals from their forest service on how to develop an entire management plan around the cryptobiotic soil. Uh, unfortunately, in Texas, we don't have a culture of looking at the ground. I work with microbes too, and a lot of people said that below ground is, nobody likes to work below ground. It's hard to work with, it's very unknown, um, and so a lot of people just see this crossed around and they've noticed it. They've seen these cool little things growing in the ground and many of the landowners um, may or may not be aware of it. And it's evident in areas where there's been no vehicles. The moment you have ATVs, they crack, they break it, and you destroy that cryptobiotic soil. So the idea is to keep, if this is a park and they're gonna try to develop it to not have you know, people walking, trampling, uh, no bicycles, and nothing that would actually break it. Treat it as you've seen. Uh, if you go to White Sands National Park, for instance, they have an entire um, bridge where you walk on the bridge because that's what's holding some of the sand, that cryptobiotic. So I hope they could do that here at ABK, you know, give you nice little tours uh, where you never step on the grass and just kind of walk on this bridge. I don't know. That's just me talking. I don't know if they're going to do that. Uh, but it would be nice to educate the public that we have those soils uh, the hill country behaves a lot like West Texas. You know, it has a lot, almost similar erosion problems. Some areas get very little rain. Uh, so they behave a lot like soils we see in West Texas. So not surprising that we see those uh, cryptobiotic crusts in those areas. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, we are out of questions, but uh, I think everybody learned a little bit. We're all interested in where this goes and I think uh, most people would prefer non-chemical methods for managing and controlling uh, some of these highly invasive non-native species. Oh, I do have one more question for you. I don't know, this is kind of a big one. Uh, are, are people still trying to develop non-native grasses and introducing them out there to, to cause more problems? I don't think so. Because I've actually been searching for seed to do indoor trials and I struggled to find sources of this uh, like this <laughs> all the native plants said we don't sell KR we don't you should not buy that seed uh, but there has to be places there and you can also harvest it yourself so I've harvested my own KR oh clever bluestem is the one I have in uh, AM San Antonio I harvest my own and have germinated my own to do cone trials and competition trials that's some other research that I do but I do not know of anybody using it currently uh, for research purposes, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it's still out there. It I'm used to be the rec yeah. you know, it used to I'm be the recommended seed mixture, right? It used to be, it's on all, on all our roads, they throw that stuff for years. So I do not know if it's been discontinued or it's still there. I don't know. It, That's a it just seems question. like, uh, well, I'm just wondering, are people still looking at non-natives to take over and fill this void when we have, you know, perfectly good natives that serve those those purposes and and we're learning more about them. So why not why not focus on um, natives? So, <laughs> but I'm glad there's folks like you that are looking at how do we reverse the negative impacts of these invasive plants once they're out there and they've they've totally destroyed a, a landscape. So yeah, it's just, it, 
Yeah, it's it's hard because what you're trying to do is understand the ecology and try to use natural mechanisms to basically help Mother Nature restore a part of it. Uh, unfortunately, you're right. Um, uh, we don't have we, you know, that that's why the Society of Ecological Restoration exists because. Yeah. We're losing the battle against the invasives and we're running out of tools. And, and I think one way to go about it is, is instead of just go at it and just try whatever and see if it works, is to begin to pay attention to the soils, maybe look at things that are obvious, use more research combined with management, applied research like we're doing right now at ABK and have more of those going on and communicate more. That's another thing. Everybody's doing their own thing in their private properties. Uh, a lot of consultants are doing stuff. Everybody claims to be an expert and have the recipe, but it's not being published and it's not being shared. So I hope that we can learn more of other techniques, you know, and see if we can find a better way to do this. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, Marianne Cox says that you can come harvest her KR Blue Stem anytime. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we've got comments on, on the, the good information and thank you so much for coming. And we really appreciate you sharing your research with us, Rodolfo. It's great to see you again. It's been a long time. Uh, thank thanks you, for Lee. for coming tonight. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. It's it's 8.09 and I think we're out of questions. So we're gonna go ahead and close it down. So everybody have a good night and thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Rodolfo. Thank you, have a good evening. You too. Good night, everybody.